Hi, I'm Athena Paquette, real estate investor of more than 25 years. I'm so glad you found our real estate investing community. If you enjoy this video's investment tips, give us a thumbs up. That way, we know that you want more investment tips just like this. And don't forget to subscribe because if you subscribe, you'll be notified right away when we uh, upload a new real estate investing tips video. And lastly, don't forget to sign up for our exclusive monthly investment tips newsletter to learn even more about real estate investing. The link is in our video description below. So now let's get going to our newest real estate investing tips video. Welcome everyone to Investor's Corner. I'm your host, Athena Paquette Cormier. And Investor's Corner is where we chat with investors who have gotten out of the rat race through investing in assets that give them passive income that's greater than their expenses or that give them the lifestyle they want. And they no longer have to go to the job whether they choose to or not. They are no longer tied to that. And we also talk to the companies who help us get there. And so today, I'm really excited to have Frank Furman come back to us. He is COO of PadSplit, and um, he's here to update us on all that's been going on since we last spoke to him, which, gosh, was October of 2019. And obviously, lots has happened not only with PadSplit, but with you all, with the industry, the world, like everything has changed. And so I can't wait to hear about what's changed at uh, pad split. And just keep in mind that this is for in educational purposes only. If you want to find out more about pad, pad split, because I heard there might be an opportunity for us who are accredited investors, hopefully that's true. Um, but at the end, we'll give you Frank's contact information to find out more and take your own steps and always, you know, seek the advice of your CPA, your attorney, anybody who advises you on what to invest in and when to invest in it and all that kind of thing. So um, without further ado, I want to introduce Frank Furman. Thanks, Frank, for coming back and updating us on Pad Split. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate and are it. you still COO? Did you get downgraded, upgraded? <laughs> uh, yeah, we, uh, I guess, side graded. I don't know. We, side graded. Uh, we, we now refer to me as the, the chief growth officer. Uh, oh, yeah, I like that. I, I like that better than COO. That's kind yeah, of you know, what, what is a COO? You know, I'm not yeah. really sure. Um, you know, to be honest, I don't know. But uh, so, yeah, I mean, mostly I, I would say my day to day hasn't really changed. I, I kind of always focused on the growth side of the business, but mm -hmm. uh, and you guys have grown a lot. So I, I, I was imagining your role had changed slightly or, or they had narrowed it down just because you can't handle everything. Like when you're a new company, you wear all hats and you, right. you don't know who's wearing which hat to begin with. And then eventually you have to define that a little bit better for the, for the growth that you've been doing. So why don't you tell people, because I'm not sure who on the line right now has been, um, went to our first, or I send out the recording of your first interview so people could get caught up. But why don't you tell us a little bit about Pad Split, its beginnings and its business model before we hit the new stuff? Yeah. So, uh, so at Pad Split, we've been around since 2017. So still a, still a young company, but as we, as we were saying earlier in the green room, you know, time flies and, uh, you know, things go quickly. Uh, so now we're, yeah, looking at our uh, fifth anniversary coming up, which is kind of wild. Uh, so, yeah, so the way that PadSplit got started was really in 2009, you know, so to, to you know, kind of go back in time. And uh, my uh, co-founder, who's also my brother-in-law, who's also our CEO, Atticus, uh, he was a real estate investor in Atlanta, and he was a commercial broker on the land side during the crash. So got hit really hard by that, but he's still young and kind of, you know, making his way, but he's looking around the market and saying, Hey, I'm seeing all these houses selling for 20 grand. You know, I should, I should buy these houses and spoiler alert. He was right. So he's building up a single family rental portfolio, you know, relatively traditional. And he buys a house in Southwest Atlanta and the two neighbors come by Mr. Otis and Mr. Mitch. And they say, Hey man, our house is being foreclosed on. We want to rent rooms in your rooming house. And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And they're like, well, <laughs> yeah, he's like, I, I, this is a normal rental. You know, I, this is, I don't know what you're talking about. And they're like, well, we'll pay you a hundred bucks a week each. And he's looking at it and he's saying, okay, well, I've got a five bedroom house. I get 800 from the housing authority. Okay. You know, let's, let's give this thing a try. So he did that one, did another one in 2012 and kind of, during this time, I was uh, I was in the Marine Corps. I was kind of out, uh, you know, 
not in Atlanta, um, you know, went from there to, uh, you know, to London and then kind of eventually ended up in Atlanta in 2016 and come, you know, kind of 2016, 2017, we were both sort of at a point in our careers where, you know, where he had this string of successful businesses, but he more or less handed off the day to day to other folks and was kind of bored with his life. I'd, uh, I'd left the world of management consulting. I'd been at McKinsey and it just kind of transitioned out and was, was kind of bored with my day to day. And, you know, so I was, we were taking long lunches and thinking about what was next and uh, looking at the market, which again, in 2017, we felt was super hot, you know, how, how naive we were, you know, so don't ask me for any kind of forward looking projections. I'm clearly the the wrong guy, but, you know, we thought, man, the market is so hot all, you know, every private equity group and, you know, institutional fund has gotten into single family, you know, there are no great deals anymore. Um, how do you build cash flow? How do you generate significantly high yields? And he's like, you know, I've had this idea kicking around, you know, I've been doing it for, you know, years and years now, this room rental model, it's incredibly profitable, much more so than traditional rentals. There's some operational headaches, but you know, there's ways to work through it. You know, how would we make this work and make it work in a big way? You know, not in a, a small number of a boarding uh, house that these guys had talked about that concept. Exactly. So, you know, that was kind of the genesis of we did a prototype house in 2017 and brought on our first customers in 2018 and then kind of started building out the team from there. Um, so it's it's been a process, certainly. Um, you know, now we're up to about 4,700 doors. We've grown a ton. We're the biggest co-living marketplace in the country. And 4,700. So when you came in October of 2019, you were in Atlanta, and I think you said there were like 300 doors, or I don't know even what you call them. Is it doors or units or rooms or how? I, how do you? Uh, yeah, I would, I would consider all those <laughs> interchangeably, you know, more or less. So yeah, with, when we say units, we mean doors, we mean bedrooms. Bedrooms, uh, right? As opposed to doors, typically would mean the whole house or whole apartment. The, yeah, the duplex um, has two, so on. Right? Okay. Exactly. So rooms. Uh, okay. Yeah, so we're um, or yeah, forty eight hundred today. So yeah, we've we've grown a fair amount since then. Um, obviously, um, yeah, that seems about right. We we're probably in the in the three hundreds in at that point in back 20- then. Yeah, yeah. So so yeah, we've grown a fair amount. We're in ten markets today, but um, you know what we've become again through kind of fits and starts is a two sided marketplace. So think like Airbnb, but instead of being fractional in terms of time with one occupancy, one occupancy. We're fractional in terms of space. So mm-hmm. rent by the room, long term, still very focused on kind of workforce housing and serving this part of the market. And and really where we've been able to distinguish ourselves, um, you know, we'll talk about other co-living and COVID and all that stuff in a bit, I'm sure, but uh, is one, a really strong focus, not on just our demographic, but on kind of customers generally. Um, and a kind of a lot of thought has gone into how we build out our product to kind of really have a a hyper focus on customers that um, I say this is with love because I'm a landlord too, but that in general landlords don't have um, landlords tend to be lazy, myself included. Um, so you know we kind of started with how do we really focus on the customer, really focus. So narrow down like your market or your or ideal client that would be in your units. Is that what you mean? Or exactly, yeah. Well, and then both both sides of the marketplace. So both focus on the landlord and kind of how we drive investor returns because that's our growth engine. Um, mm-hmm. And then also on this very specific, very underserved part of the market, this kind of workforce housing side. Um, okay. So both the the owner client, the property mm-hmm. owner that is your client, and yeah. then the tenant or guest or customer. Exactly. Client. Okay. Exactly. Occupant client. Yeah. Okay. So... So yeah, we've you know, and so we've just kind of made it work from there. So yeah, it's uh, it's wild to think about, you know, yeah, in twenty nineteen. That's unbelievable, actually. Just barely three years to, to have that kind of growth, and in ten markets instead of the one. Mm. I remember when we spoke in October two thousand nineteen. You said you were headed to Houston to you had already started setting the groundwork, and you were going to kind of start making deals, right? So that's yeah. a lot of growth. So yeah, we are we are in Houston now. H- launching in Houston was a lot harder than we thought. To be perfectly honest, it took us mm-hmm. a long time to get there. Uh, and what were the main stumbling blocks for that market? So I would say there were two. So when we um, when we started, you know, we kind of thought, hey, there are two rational businesses that we could enter. One is a traditional real estate operation, right? Where you buy, you, know, you raise money, buy, renovate, manage properties, full stack. Mm-hmm. You're right. 
Door two is this asset light marketplace. The problem was we didn't have enough money for the real estate you know, fund. And then problem two was we didn't have the technology platform built. So we kind of did neither and built a property management company and sort of proved it out, kind of bootstrapping our way. And, you know, ultimately we we kind of build in some, you know, not really technical debt, but almost a, a business model debt. So we went in and said, okay, well, we were doing everything. We we're doing all the operations, prove out the model and build confidence in it. But we didn't really build the technology at first to where anybody could manage anywhere. And so that became a, a stumbling block where, you know, we were really dependent on having in-house operations, having people on the ground, kind of being in the market. And that became very hard to sort of transplant into new markets the way that we right. wanted. And the second piece of it um, was COVID. So we were, uh, you know, going into Houston, working with landlords, kind of talking with folks and so on. And and as, as you know, and as kind of everyone knows, real estate investors are very, um, you know, tangible. Real bricks, real sticks, they want to touch the asset, they want to walk the properties, all those things, especially to be first in the market. You know, it's a big, a big leap for folks. So yeah. I remember the, you know, the spring of 2020, like, okay, we've got a few folks, we're working with them. We'd set up a prototype house there that was kind of a, a show house that we were renting. And I was scheduled the second week of March to basically do a blitz of every real estate investor association meeting in greater Houston, you know, every night, a different double tree kind of thing. Wow. And uh, that was the week of March 14th, 2020. And every single one of those meetings got canceled because COVID. Mm -hmm. And, you know, essentially it really bogged us down um, because travel was shut down more or less. And even, you know, we've, we've a very high touch model on the supply side, on the landlord side. And so Meeting with meaning, meaning you meet with the landlords to to explain to them fa- like face to face or especially early on absolutely okay yeah and, right you know a lot of the things that we do even today where we're going and fortunately a lot of this is kind of back up and running but you know going to investor events going to conferences meeting people looking them in the eye maybe walking an asset showing them how you know a house gets divided up or how you think about it all those sorts of things are really important and there's no way to sort of downplay it. So while we were growing really well, um, you know, had strong growth in Atlanta because we were already known and, you know, you could still do the tours and that kind of thing. Right. It was almost impossible in new markets. So, um, so yeah, we, we struggled to launch in Houston and ultimately what it meant was that we needed to just kind of one, get through it and still just, you know, accept that it was slow. So did you pause it or did you, no, well, I mean, I guess or you was, just kept working on it slowly over the phone. How did you how did you keep going as yeah, opposed so, to pausing the whole thing in Houston? So essentially, what we did was we uh, we did two things. One, you know, we kept going, working with investors. It was just slower than we'd like. Um, and then the second thing was we started a sidecar fund, essentially, and, you know, raised a small amount of money um, and started buying. And our, essentially, we were looking at the problem and saying, we thought it was really a credibility gap and maybe it was, you know, I think uh, it's hard to say because it was such a strange time in a lot of yeah. ways. Uh, well, faith and trust kind of got, I think, abolished by the situation. We were, we all were in with the government shutting things right. down and opening, shutting, opening. Sh- I don't know what it was on your coast, but here mm-hmm. it was like, you're open, you shut, you're, you know, and, and everyone, Indiana was different. The, the Dakotas were, di- you know, every state was operating differently. So I, I would imagine going into a new market and having you trust, you know, not that you're not trustworthy, but their sense of <laughs> who sure. to trust was like about, you know, completely obliterated. So yeah. I, I think yeah, we probably ball. had that and didn't know it at the time. Yeah. And there were, there were specific questions that were totally fair and legitimate. And honestly, we, we struggled to answer them because as uh, you know, if you're a landlord in Houston and you've never met us, never heard of us, all those things. Great. You're looking at this co-living model, this new thing that you don't understand. (laughs) With the pandemic going on. Oh, sure. People will agree to live together. (laughs) Exactly. Sure. You know, will strangers move in? No problem there. (laughs) Right. And uh, and then also with uh, the eviction moratorium and folks are looking at and saying, well, okay, so I've um, evictions are always tough. They're always part of the business. You know, that's not um, anything new. But what happens right now? Will I ever be able to get someone out? And the honest answer was, God, we have no idea. <laughs> you know, we don't, don't know, know how long they're going to play this game. Our, yeah, Our crystal ball is cloudy. Um, 
So all those things, I mean, all those lockdown questions, all those sorts of uh, things were were totally fair questions from investors thinking about the problem. Um, I'm not mm-hmm. talking about them, um, but they were a stumbling block for us. So we decided to force the issue with uh, essentially our own capital. And so we build up a portfolio of homes there, you know, small, you know, about 10. Then we found we were working with a family office that said, okay, well, you know, you've proven enough with your own houses. We'll buy those. So we right. sold those houses. And was the family office based in Houston or a different state? Back, actually based in New York. New York. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's not like they had a comfort level with that market. They just said, okay, we see that you know what you're doing and here's some exactly. money. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So they, um, and we've been working with them in Atlanta and they said, okay, you know, hey, we'll we'll follow you to Houston. Um, you know, we'll, we'll kind of make this work. Uh, again, a really kind of great partner that we've, they've now expanded to Jacksonville and Tampa with us and, and kind of been, been, yeah, great partner. But, you know, at the time it was a big leap for them, but they bought mm-hmm. kind of a first tranche of houses, kind of nine or 10. And then we kind of kept from there. And, and so it was, it was slow, I think is, is the honest answer, but we forced it with essentially buying the first couple to prove it out. And yeah, and then, that's uh, hard. And, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, um, not that that didn't have its own struggles, you know, permitting in a COVID uh, environment and all those sorts of things and hiring Mm -hmm. um, certainly was a challenge. What kind of permitting did you go through? You mean for your industrial kitchen or what kind of things? uh, Usually it'd be more for like garage conversions or if you're adding a bathroom. Um, You know, it always depends on the asset. I mean, sometimes if you're just doing something really light and it's general repair, you know, we're, we're very eager to not go through that process if you don't have to, um, uh-huh, you right. Past it, but you know, sometimes you can't avoid it. And, you know, you're asking for a stop work if you're say converting a garage or, or that kind of thing. So, mm-hmm. uh, so again, that was obviously a slow process during that time. So we, we had to work through that, but either way, we got those first ones up and then that was kind of the one track. The other one was really developing out our technical product and building in the features that were required so that, it would be realistic. Yeah, the, the platform for everyone to apply to live there, pay their rent, like all of that, right? You guys have developed a platform for basically rent management, tenant management, owner exactly. management, right? Exactly. So the financial parts, I mean. Yep, exactly. So I'll, we built the resident facing side first, and that had been pretty good. You know, we thought, it, you know, ne- never perfect, you know, we're never done, but that was more or less completely functional. What we needed to build out was really the host side in our in our kind of verbiage, but the the landlord side, the owner side. Mm-hmm. So building out the tools that let it them. I mean, I'll I'll give you an example. Um, you know, if someone submits a a ticket, you know, a, a maintenance ticket in the platform, but there's six people in the house, everyone can see it. So that way, if you know, it cuts down on duplicates. And then if, you know, if you and I live in the house, you see it. And if a plumber shows up, you don't think, who's this creep? It's like, oh, it's a, it's really a, a you know. Right. A so the it. system pings all the residents that someone will be there between such and such and such and such. Or or more Time. that, um, I mean, the the host can do that or they, yeah, can, it can be done. The communications are all built in, but it's just the visibility that, hey, the, you know, I may live upstairs. I might never use the downstairs bathroom but I know there's a leaky sink because I see the ticket. So now when a plumber shows up, I feel better. You know, it's not a scam because I didn't ask for the plumber. You know, Right, kind of, right. Yeah, I would think it's visible. hard enough to coordinate with one tenant. I, I, you know, I can see where if you have four or five people in a house, it would be, you know. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So building out all those workflows for the, for the landlord, the screening and setting up occupancies and, you know, great visibility into the financials and being able to, you know, add line items or to take away line items, all those, all those sorts of things that are really just kind of nuts and bolts, but were a hundred percent necessary for a host to really kind of manage their property. Well, Mm -hmm. Um, so just real quick, is that all proprietary uh, stuff or did you use plugins from other industry um, uh, products? Yeah, a little bit of both. So, I mean, I'll I'll give an example. Um, We do, um, I mean, the, the platform's ours. We build it all. You know, we have a, a huge team of engineers. You know, we've got 160 people now on the team. And oh my big, god, yeah, big <laughs> wow. operation. Um, so we, yeah, bun- bunch of folks. A lot of them, you know, way above my pay grade. You know, really kind of uh, great at what they do. But there are certain things where you're you're definitely getting off the shelf. So, for example, we do income verification of everyone coming in. 
we uh, partner with this company called Plaid that you may, you've probably used at some point. Uh, mm-hmm. You essentially log into your bank account. That lets us check directly their bank account, but in a secure way. Right. Uh, Make sure they have the deposit and all that, right? Exactly. And all the background checks we're, we're partnered with or credit checks. You know, that's, so we're, we're plugging in a lot of different capabilities that would be almost impossible for us to build. Um, mm-hmm. Right. You know, tying it all together is... is And reinventing the wheel is not necessary in a lot of cases, right? It's exactly. just a, a functionality thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I mean, yeah, some of these things, Hey, I'd, I'd much rather have someone else doing the background check, you know, for yeah. it's like, let, let them uh, hold that liability. And I mean, mm-hmm. all sorts of things where, you know, we don't see the credit cards, it's all done through a payment processor that makes it a little bit easier right. from right. A perspective. So, so yeah, it's, it's a mix, but yeah, we've definitely built a ton of the stuff out ourselves. Certainly. Okay. So Houston, you've got how many uh, rooms or doors or whatever now? 500 or so, 600. 500. Yeah. So that's pretty good s- scale. Yeah. Um, so what cities, can you just name off what cities Absolutely. you're in to give us kind of an overall? Absolutely. Feel? So we are in Atlanta, Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth. We are in Tampa, Orlando, Jacksonville, New Orleans, Richmond, Virginia, Indianapolis, Las Vegas. That's all 10. Okay, so I've got Atlanta, Houston, Dallas, Fort Worth, Tampa. I'm, oh, did you yeah. say St. Pete? No. Uh, well, we, are, we are also Jacksonville. in Jacksonville. Uh, we are in Tampa, Orlando, Jacksonville, the whole kind Orlando. of high okay. corridor. Yeah. Okay. And then Richmond, Las Vegas, and Indianapolis. Yeah. So we're very excited because remember when we first met, I was like, we have all these investors in Indianapolis, Pittsburgh, well, Florida. Sure. We're, we're in Southeast Florida, but. Um, so we're excited about Indianapolis. So how many homes do you have built built there? Or, or relatively small. Number. So we have uh, we we've activated relatively recently. I think we just have maybe twenty doors or so. Um, okay. We have about fifty properties in the pipeline. So there's a fair amount of uh, business. Fifty properties. Is yeah. Fifty or fifteen. Fifty five zero. Wow. Okay. There's so I, I there's quite a few being uh, built out or. or Yep. Coming on to the platform. Okay. So uh, tell me, what is your ideal property that you're looking for? So it can depend a little bit market to market, but in general, you're looking for properties where you can get to a certain number of bedrooms, maybe post renovation, because that's your revenue generating unit um, at a reasonable price. We like things that, um, so that's that's kind of the, the core of it is how many bedrooms can I get to? Um, so is there a minimum bedroom, three m- minimum or four? So we don't, minimum we, don't or what's... Hard, we don't have a hard minimum. It really comes down to the unit economics and what your okay. alternatives are. Um, so we have three bedroom apartments. I would say that's really on the small side. We have 10 bedroom homes. Now there's a, there's a whole process that we go through with folks where, there's lots of places you can't do a 10 bedroom home, either for regulatory or just kind of reasons of prudence. Um, but there's places where you can. Um, so really that kind of comes down to sort of the process that we go through with investors, oftentimes even pre-acquisition or looking at their portfolio to say, hey, this one looks good. Hey, this one would be really tough. Hey, this one just went in pencil. You're already at highest and best use, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but average is around six. So that, that I think is about a sweet spot, you know, big enough that you're getting a huge Six bump. bedrooms. Oh yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and you know, some smaller, some bigger, so it all just, all just sort of depends, but, um, but that's about where you're really getting a big bump in yield, but it's still quite manageable um, in terms of number of bathrooms and, you know, space and that kind of thing, parking. Mm. And that kind of gets into the secondary <laughs> property um, we love being close to public transit or major employment centers. Um, okay. We uh, we love areas where parking is available. So, and you know, ample street parking or parking, you know, off street, that kind of thing. So, you know, when we're working with an investor and say, you know, the investor comes and you might come to us and say, hey, what do you think about 123 Main Street? And we'll say, ah, oh, it's on a cul-de-sac. Parking will be really tight. We don't like that because that might lead to neighbor complaints because, you know, our, the residents are human, you know, they are, they're cut from the crooked timber that is humanity and they, they fall short from time to time. Sometimes uh-huh. they're jerks, you know, that, that happens. Um, and so, you know, we want to 
minimize that as much as possible. So we might look at another property and say, oh, it's a corner lot. You've got tons of street parking or, oh, it's got parking that goes back behind the house. It'll get cars off the street. You know, that's that's great. Yeah, because if your average is six bedrooms, you're un- well, it's well, I don't want to say unlikely, but having parking to match that many people who maybe at least half have cars might yeah. only be a one or two car garage with a driveway. Exactly. Right. So, so I can see where that gets out of balance, I guess. Right. So exactly. that's why you look for that. And all the more reason to be close to public transit because it makes it a little bit easier, opens it up to more, more kind of folks. And yeah, I mean, we have a, we have a house in West Atlanta that um, I mean, it's, I guess you would probably call it a duplex, but there's, there's 14 bedrooms. Now it's really a duplex. It's in student housing. There's student housing kind of to the right and to the left of it, mm. uh, but there is no parking. But you can walk to the train station. There's a bus mm. stop right there. And so it's never been an issue. It fits in with kind of the fabric of the community because it's student housing all around. Right. Uh, and, you know. Yeah, there so there's no upset and the neighbors don't care because that's the the whole neighborhood sort of is. If, in yeah. The if anything, it's the quietest house because, uh, you know, the average age of our resident is about 38. Mm-hmm. You know, the working people. Students, uh, you know, God love them, but they're uh, louder and, uh, you know, having more fun, so to speak. Well, and typically are not working. So there's unless they're in school, they're at that property probably or, you know, and all kinds of strange hours. So, yeah. So it would be more likely that your residents would complain about that. Yeah, (laughs) You know, (laughs) I'm sure they are. You know, tell them to keep it down. So, yeah. uh, Yeah. So who manages? um, who, you know, in a new uh, area that you're in, who's who's managing all of that? And so, how, how do you have the repair people? How do you build your team in these areas? Yeah. So in general, um, most of our business is, again, just like Airbnbs and that we're just the marketplace platform. So the, the host, the owner, or more often their property manager is responsible for the maintenance, right? They're the one hosting the property, doing the maintenance. They, they're using the software for getting the work orders, perhaps, or kind of managing and communicating. But, you know, typically... So it, we as owners of the property would have a manager to manage these things. That's right. And we've Got built it. Okay. An, a vendor network um, of mm-hmm. folks to because we'll provide training and that kind of thing. And we'll, we'll even train, you know, if you were to come to me tomorrow and say, hey, I've got my property manager in Indianapolis great. We can fly someone out there, train them, you know, all that sort of good stuff. Cause we want folks who know how to do this. That's we've kind of vested. Right. In. So the property manager that we have may mm. not be the right manager for this business model. Right. Cause I can already see where the, the property manager who doesn't want to be messing with stuff. Like we have one, she likes to set it and be done for three years. She, you know, she prices right. things a little low. She, you know, but she has very steady income. But yeah, I don't see her wanting to do this kind of probably higher maintenance. Um, yeah, it's it's, it's not so you need a different that. you. Yeah, you'd have to find someone, I guess. Right. And so, yeah, there's definitely uh, I would say with property managers, it depends. Now, we have built out a property management company. Um, I don't believe we're operating in Indianapolis, to be honest, but um, we're operating about half of our markets where we manage that. It's a subsidiary company that we built to to help folks out who really don't want to teach it, and that's fine. Right. Uh, okay. We that's found what I thought you said that you guys manage, but yeah, yeah. No, that's in you know in new not, markets. That's tough, right? Because it could be two thousand miles away. Maybe you don't have the team, like you know, mostly the uh, the handyman and the plumbers, electric, you know, the the workers that you need to fix the property. Right. We build it out with in markets where we've got enough volume and demand to make it kind of worth. Right. Right. Um, so Indy would be hard because it's a, a newer market. But you're growing. Dollars. Yeah. But it's uh, yours is not a lot, but you got 50 properties in the pipeline. So yeah, yeah it could it could definitely be there. But yeah, I mean, Indy's done really well for us. Um, you know, it's yeah, I mean, it, we've had really high occupancy. There's just clearly a strong demand in the market for it. There's a uh, really strong demand. And yeah. I'm thinking also in that market, you know, if the average rent is say, I don't know, eight, $900 a month and you're getting a hundred dollars a week, that's cheaper for the tenant, but then it's uh, more money for the landlord. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And it's uh, that that's exactly right. So 
and the assets, uh, you know, you can still buy houses at, you know, certainly much cheaper than you can in Southern California. In oh, yeah. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it can be it's really a pretty high yield market. Mm-hmm. And so you're not focusing on downtown or like I'm wondering where your where your ideal uh, tenant is going to want to live. Right. Yeah. So do you have do you have uh, data on that or research on that or? Yeah, I mean, less so in, in Indianapolis specifically, but generally across kind of um, all of our markets, we're not really downtown in like a central business dis- district. Again, we're we're in apartments as well, but we're very single family dominated just by the Right, nature. to get the room count, right? Exactly, exactly. So, you know, you wouldn't really be downtown per se, but generally within kind of the, the urban core, if you will. Right. Um, so either in, you know, Atlanta proper or in kind of close in suburbs, um, mm-hmm. there's a lot of public transit. Um, you know, you're generally going to be in transitioning kind of neighborhoods just because that's where you're still close into the urban core, but you're not paying kind of top dollar sort of thing. I mean, right. for example, because we're serving singles, you know, school districts aren't a huge matter of importance for folks. Mm-hmm. Um, and is it so I guess it is mostly single people that rent from you? Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, or for example, here, um, you know, the area around the airport, which is south of Atlanta, um, you can buy for, you know, relatively cheap compared to some other parts of town, because a lot of people don't want to live under runway five um, of the busiest airport in the country. <laughs> but for us, is it really? Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, no, Atlanta. Yeah, huge airport. Um, and uh, for a while, it was busiest in the world, though. We were overtaken by a Chinese airport at some point, but okay. either way, very, very, very busy. Um, however, it's also the biggest employer in the area. So for us, it's there's really strong demand around there because we have tons of folks who work at the airport. You know, they work in baggage channeling or in fast food or hospitality. Mm-hmm. Great. And, you know, if you're going to be there for a year or two, being close to the airport is more of a convenience than a nuisance. So yeah. A lot of those properties in kind of College Park or Forest Park, you know, these kind of close in, um, you know, not part of the city, but kind of uh, suburb, you know, suburban areas around uh, the airport. Mm-hmm. Investors have just really, really, really done well. Mm-hmm. So what does an owner pay you for being part of your system or your platform or what have you? So we we take 12 percent of collected rents. OK, so there's no kind of sign up fees or setup fees or cleaning fees or any, any such things where we essentially took what Airbnb does and did the exact same thing. So we had right. creativity when they filed their when they went public and filed their SEC documentation. They said they were taking 13 and percent as their take rate. We said that seems like about 12. And we went from there. OK. OK. Pretty simple, right? I'd love to this, tell you we'll put a ton, Yeah, I'd love to tell you we put a ton of thought into it. We were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, they're worth a hundred billion dollars. They can't be that dumb. Let's do yeah, that. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, so you don't own a lot of the property. So I'm just looking at my notes. Yeah. Um, you're mostly so they're not even master leases, right? So, or like you're not leasing from the property owner. The property owner is. We do technically sign a lease, but it's a cash flow lease. Um, now, most of because the- Because who, who are the people renting from? I guess that's my question. The, are the tenants or your guests or whatever you're calling them, are yeah. they renting from us, the owner, or from you, and then you're renting from us? They're technically subletting, but it's um, we do provide a lease. Now, most of that is for our host benefit because it makes the debt side much easier. It makes you know in getting insurance just much more straightforward. Right. Uh, there does need to be documentation if you know you do ever have to file an eviction that kind of thing. I mean that's that's kind of why it's there, uh, but we do it really for yeah for our host convenience. And who files the eviction then? We do or you do? You do. Okay. Yeah. So we're just basically paying you like you said like an Airbnb platform. Airbnb doesn't have anything to do really with the uh, with the guests. It's, we all interact with those guys, right? So mm-hmm. so same thing with this. Okay. Unless you're using our management company or what have you, but. Uh, okay. Right. Right. Okay. And have you gotten any pushback uh, or maybe this is why you're in the certain cities on the kind of the short-term rental pushback stuff that goes on in some cities? Do you, do you, do you find that or do you find out first 
this what the city's attitude is or like yeah. I, I've gone so far as to read city council meeting minutes and, you know, trying to figure out where their heads are at. Right. So um, how, how do you avoid that situation? It's a great question. Um, it's complicated, I think, is the is the short answer. So um, there is a reason why we're in the cities we're in and the markets we're in. Um, you know, why are we in the Sun Belt in the Midwest? Because they're much friendlier to landlords and generally mm -hmm. uh, lean heavier on the property rights and landlord rights versus tenant rights side. Mm -hmm, uh, right. On the other hand, um, you know, we're, we're a marketplace, you know, people really can kind of open up anywhere and, and real estate is hyper local. I mean, to use Atlanta as an example, just because I know it so well, there's 83 municipalities in Metro Atlanta. We're in about 20 of them. 83 but, municipalities, 83. like many incorporated exactly. cities like where they're their own standard their own cities. Zoning, oh, okay you know, their own zoning definitions and all these things so oh. it's it's really hard and i mean airbnb who we we actually have a, a bit of a relationship with um they only have uh regulatory certainty in three jurisdictions and they're in over a hundred thousand so it's just and really what do you mean by regulatory certainty meaning the coast is clear and they know it exactly okay so they've, um, you know, and this isn't a knock, this is just the reality of what they've had to do is they've had to operate and learn as they go. Cause when they started, you know, now 14 years ago, um, it was essentially legal everywhere, but there was really just renting out rooms in people's houses and mm -hmm. you know, legislation changed, right? People kind yeah, of- Yeah, Airbnb uh, started a little differently than VRBO or Verbo, people exactly. call it Verbo, but it yep. was actually vacation rentals by owner. So they were actually in the name, right? Whereas yep. Airbnb was a little yeah. different. Exactly. So, you know, all that to say, um, it's very, very hard and it can be a moving target. Um, yeah. So we do a few things, you know, one is uh, we think of it as really a comprehensive risk mitigation effort. So part of it is, yes, we do that legal review and look at municipalities, but it's pretty hard to look kind of across the board if there's 83 in a municipality, mm -hmm. um, aren't quite as uh, crazy as Atlanta. You know, we're in Jacksonville. Jacksonville is a huge city and land area. You know, it's it's a little bit easier. We're in Houston. Houston is enormous in land area, it makes it a little bit simpler. Maybe we're just mm -hmm. late. You know, we're meaning they don't have all those standalone incorporated cities. Exactly. Or if, cities, I guess. Exactly. You get much further out to to kind of get to them. Um, so that's part of it. Um, a big part of it is really kind of thinking through where the asset is within the city. So even within um, Atlanta, and Atlanta has very permissive zoning among the most permissive of any of the cities in the country. Um, we've had issues where you know, neighbors don't care what the zoning says. They care about, did someone park like a jerk? Did they mow their grass? Is there trash? You know, all those sorts of things. Right. And so it doesn't help you to have, or it does help, but it doesn't save you. It's not a silver bullet to have really permissive zoning or be totally by the book because mm -hmm. if neighbors mad at you, they'll keep calling. And if code enforcement keeps getting called, they will issue a ticket. They'll ticket. figure out what to charge you with, right? Yeah, they'll, they'll make Just up to get uh, these people off their back or make exactly. them happy or whatever. Yeah. So, so you know, there's definitely an aspect of there. You know, for ex HOAs are a great example. Mm -hmm. HOAs, we've had some folks do it. I would recommend against it, and we will. You know, if you call one of our, you know, someone on our team and say, "I've got a property in HOA. What do you think?" You know, we'll we'll almost hang up the phone. You know, so. we think you should sell it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, or you know, put on Airbnb, let them handle it. Uh, right. So we we kind of uh, you know we're we're quite stern in that in that kind of regard. So we you know we say no to a lot of business where we think it's too high risk. Um, we think that people will get in trouble. Um, so that's definitely part of it. But how you renovate it, how you manage it, a lot of it's just blocking and tackling. If a property is selected right, you know, done well, you know it's not a shabby job. It's, you know, made to look nice and, you know, at least is, you know, pretty nice for the neighborhood kind of thing. If it's managed well, you know, the grass is cut and trash is picked up and, you know, you're responsive, you're pretty safe anywhere. And if you don't do those things, you're safe nowhere is really the problem. Even if the zoning, I mean, Houston is no zoning. Um, you can have a. That's what I was. Oh, maybe you told me that last time. I was yeah. shocked. Thanks for reminding me of that. Yeah, why we're there. I mean, How is have... that possible? Well, so there, a part of it's kind of just the the culture of a part of it's, it's a huge area and it's just sort of grown that way. I mean, you can have a 
strip mall next to a strip mine next to a strip club. You know, it's all fine there. Um, <laughs> that is fine. <laughs> and it's flat, you know, and, and all those things. So it makes it a little bit easier than some other areas. But um, they still have neighborhoods and HOAs have really filled the gap, you know, and that's kind of, uh, they're filled the vacuum to some extent. But there's no zoning in Houston. You can do whatever you want. That being said, neighbors are people. It's not like people in Houston don't care about their neighborhoods and all those things. So you can still get complaints and you can always, you know, if you have a hole in a screen or a cracked flagstone or all those things, or your grass isn't cut, you know, there's, you can be totally within zoning or zoning cannot exist. You can still get in trouble if you don't operate well. So, so your neighbors are really the, the very much bottom up rather than top down. Right. But exactly. they're the judge. And if it seems like, and correct me if I'm wrong, if you don't get along with your neighbors, the neighbors can complain maybe to city council, maybe to the police. Totally. Like now it's there's no there's no law or zoning to say, well, look, I'm within the zoning law or law. What we, you know, there's nothing in real estate that is a get out of jail free card. You know, anytime you want to do anything, there are people who don't want you to do it. You know, so that's that's kind of the nature of it. Now, the difference between us and Airbnb and I, this is not a knock on Airbnb. I have a ton of respect. I'm a customer, you know, all those sorts of things. Um, first is that we have a different type of neighbor complaint. Ours tends to be more socioeconomic. You know, hey, here's a bunch of renters. I don't like this. This looks like it might be section. Yeah, eight. just the fact that you have many people going in and out is what a lot of people say. They don't yeah. like that they're going in and out. <laughs> it's like yeah. there's too many people living there. So we'll, we deal with that. Airbnb deals with party houses, mm -hmm. right? That's their, that's the neighbor complaint. It's, Hey, there is, you know, I mean, here in Atlanta, we get the SEC championship. We, you know, whatever, one of the big sports events, you get a bunch of frat boys down and they're partying and people don't like that. Right. Um, the other piece of it is uh, hotels don't like Airbnb, right? They, uh, the Marriott's uh, of the world lobby against it. They're not paying right. hotel tax, all that stuff. So they have a pretty organized opposition that's well funded. We don't, you know. So we, the apartment association, the like, there's no uh, trade group that goes against you so far. No, I mean, part of it is that we're a lot smaller than Airbnb. You know, that's definitely part of it. Um, uh -huh. The other piece of it is, you know, no one is like apartments are super fragmented. You know, there's no real apartment association that speaks you know, for everybody that has a voice or, or whatever. Extended stay motels are a competitor of ours, um, but it's super fragmented. No one likes extended stay, but there's no kind of big brand of apartments or big brand of- That can come stay. after you or whatever, yeah. Right. Now, I, uh, I'm i an ambitious individual. I'm hoping that at some point we're so big that they will choose to do so. Um, yeah, but that you will be a threat. So exactly. I've got a question here from Keith, yeah. back to the neighborhood yeah. thing. Uh, yeah. So, you know, we always kind of think of A, B and C neighborhoods. So mm -hmm. um, and I'll have a follow up to this. But so are you looking only for A neighborhoods, B neighborhoods, C neighborhoods? Like where is your suites? Like we'll just say A neighborhoods will have the higher long term renter rent yep. and nicer neighborhood. Maybe yep. it is in the better schools that your guests don't. Yep necessarily care about or is it more the b neighborhood where you know you can get the cheaper property to make the numbers work like what what do you see as it might, might be too general but what do you yeah, see no, as your your neighborhood type that you're looking for it's a great question and probably more b's and c's i mean there is there is sort of a sweet spot i mean um maybe we would say we wouldn't be in the d's or the f's kind of thing um there's definitely right. a a low low end that just from an oper you know, operability standpoint, I think tends to be tough and I would warn people away. You know, mm -hmm. if you can't, if you don't feel comfortable sending a plumber there on a Friday night, you probably don't want to be there. And it's probably, you know, you're going to have issues and all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. That being said, if you get to those kind of A neighborhoods, those really nice neighborhoods, um, it's just hard to make a deal pencil. You know, if you can get a great rent from a family because there's a great school district and all those sorts of things, you might not, you might be doing, you know, your highest and best use kind of where you are today. And also you're more likely to have neighbors that are. Yeah. There might be neighbor pushback on, on that, right. In the A neighborhood. Exactly. And I mean, that's true of any rental property, um, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's co-living or not, you know, it's a matter of, and look, we all fall somewhere on that spectrum. I mean, I'd 
there we have people, whether it's internally or kind of allies or what have you, where they're like, oh, the NIMBYs, you know, we got to stop them and all those things. And you think, you know, I live on a quiet street. I have three kids. I love the fact that I know all my neighbors and that if, you know, my kids are walking around, they know where they, you know, all my neighbors know them and that kind of thing. And it's quiet. And um, so like, hey, I look, I think people have a right to do with what they want with their property. But look, I, I like the fact that I know all my neighbors and they're long term and all those things. And um, they know me and I know them. I think that's great. But so anyway, there's there's definitely a high end and a low end that um, I would probably avoid for different reasons. Um, so you want to be kind of more in the middle in general. But, um, you know, if you're looking for yield and you're not selecting for school district and you're selecting for public transit, you tend to be more in that B.C. area. Mm hmm. Right. So, uh, so a follow up to that is like, how, how do you, well, it's kind of different. So how do you market to get the tenants then? So you've got, ideally you've got your BC neighborhood, maybe it normally rents for let's say 800 to a thousand dollars. Now you've got four bedrooms. You're hoping to get what I guess, 1600 a month. Um, you're including all utilities, right? This is, this is their all in number, right? Nobody's paying utilities separate. So, so this is, the tenants all in number, and then you have to account for this stuff and you have more people there. So, um, so how are you attracting the, your guests? How do they find out that there's, do you just post, Hey, the rent's only a hundred a week or like, I'm, I'm wor- wondering about the wording and attracting the right tenants, even though it's super affordable. Yeah. So most of it is, uh, is digital. We do have print ads and kind of bus shelters and, you know, uh, public transit and that sort of thing. But Google and Facebook ads are kind of the big two. Uh, we have a pretty strong search engine optimization effort. You know, if you search for, you know, rooms for rent in Atlanta or cheap apartments, okay, that, rooms for rent. Okay. you know, that'll, we're going to be pretty high in those things and we're going to be advertising that space. Uh, referrals are big for us, you know, especially in kind of our more established markets. Uh, mm-hmm. we, we do subsidize them, you know, but for us, that's a cheap way to find, find folks. Um, so it's, it's a mix of things. I mean, we've, uh, we don't really do a ton on the partnership side. We've learned, you know, it's, it's kind of, uh, more straightforward to sort of advertise, but it's pretty traditional kind of digital marketing effort. Okay. Okay. And then how do you coach, um, the, the, you know, the potential, uh, owner host, mm. how do you, so, cause what you have it, so how a property looks yep. uh, to rent to, to a family or to, to a couple or whatever, how it looks now is not necessarily how it needs to be set up for your business model. So how do you coach someone? Do we send you pictures and, and your team says, Oh, well, here's how it needs to look. And then we send our guys in to make it look that way yeah. or. Uh, it's a mix of things. So, I mean, um, we definitely do uh, both virtual and in-person walkthroughs, you know, depending on the market and kind of where you are and uh, all those sorts of things. I mean, I've walked, I wish it were a hundred properties, 500 properties, easy. Um, wow. it's, um, it's not rocket science. You know, most people you walk one or two, they kind of get it. You know, there's only so many ways you can kind of split up a living room or kind of find bedrooms. I'd love to tell you I'm the the world's expert. I'm just, uh, you know, just a guy who, who's done it a few times. Right. Uh, but we'll, yeah, we'll, you know, we do that all the time. Again, even pre-acquisition with, with folks. Um, well, because you, of- I would imagine that you're trying to get to uniformity so that when someone is with pad split, you know, it's all, like, not that Airbnb is this way, but sort of it is, you know, mm-hmm. the hosts had figured out, you know, clean walls and light color, you know, whatever it is for the market. Yeah. Um, I imagine you have a, a, a profile or a look that that you've seen works best. Right. And if I remember right, these are furnished. I mean, we're providing everything. Right. This is like they are moving in. If they call you that afternoon and pass the tests or whatever, yep, check in, in, check in yeah. tests, they're in. Right. Exactly. So there's definitely some best practices. We have a lot of content on that kind of online or, you know, that we can we can deliver. Um we are relatively agnostic, you know, we won't say, oh, the, the picture on the wall has to have a sailboat, you know, yeah, I wish we were that smart where we knew kind of to that level. Most people want to kind of make it their own a little bit or, hey, what's available or, you know, I'm going on Amazon and whatever shipping the fastest or, you know, it's all right. fun from our point of view. Um, what we feel that we know is, yeah, is kind of best practices, what has worked or what the pros and cons are of different things. You know, if 
which kind of lock should I use? Well, there's pros and cons, you know, there's costs, there's kind of ease of operability, ease of install, you know, all these, which has more privacy, less privacy, and all those things are um, important. And to some extent, um, two people might look at them differently and make different decisions, you know, and that's, and that's fine. Um, and sometimes people, you know, they've got their, the furniture place that they like, or this or that, or, I mean, mm -hmm. I think about our first, uh, our first host is a woman named Heather Wren. Uh, she had a, or still has an interior decorating business and, you know, she'd set up a house and she's like, Oh, you know, what do you think about this or that? And I, I'd be like, Oh, you know, I think this, and like, here's our like document on what we do. And she's like, with respect, you have terrible taste and I'm not taking your advice. I'm much better at this than you. And I'm like, you were right. Yeah, but I wonder if she doesn't do a little too over the top or a little maybe, too, you maybe know. Maybe she does. Maybe she does. Um, you know, and she, uh, but she I love feels that. good about it, I guess. She feels good about it. And she's actually uh, essentially retired off this. Uh, she's gotten to 10 houses and she's essentially quit her job, but she's, and her husband retired her husband. Um so yeah, I mean, I can. Uh, she's she's done something right. Um, I don't know if she has to be so direct in her feedback about my lack of taste, but uh, <laughs> she is she is right in that as well. So, so all that to say, you know, we're agnostic. We do know some things and have some opinions, but um, you know, people can kind of make it their own. Um, but yeah, I mean, there aren't that many ways. I mean, most of the rooms, you know, they are they are. They're going to be a, a ten by twelve square. You know, it's it's you, you, that's kind of where you are. It's fine. Um, but yeah, we, we get pretty involved. And then part of it is working with general contractors in lots of areas where, you know, if you want to do a house in Houston, great. Hey, this is, you know, Jim, he's a GC who's done this a bunch of times. He can kind of take you from zero to hero or, you know, we'll do those trainings. So it's a mix of things. I mean, for us, we are hyper-focused on investor returns and experience because, you know, I've been selling this for a long time. I don't think I'm that good at it. Um, I wish I were our hosts are good at selling it, right? It's, uh, you know, they're not, I'm not on commission either, but, um, you know, they're, they're unconflicted. So for us, when a host does it, they're making a great, you know, a return and they go to their local event or talk to their friends and brag about it. That's how we grow. Mm -hmm. They aren't doing well, you know, or it wasn't clear, smooth or whatever. The opposite happens and they complain about it mm -hmm. and, uh, and all those things. So, you know, setting up a property is work. Um, even just overseeing a general contractor or anything, like all this stuff is work. It's not easy. Um, right. You know, everyone wants a truly passive investment. I think that's really, really hard in real estate um, to be truly, truly, truly passive. Uh -huh. uh, and so, but we want to make it as easy as possible because for us, that's that's our growth engine. Right. So um, I have a couple of questions here for... Uh, um, from, so Keith has a couple of questions. So he first wants to know about the eviction rate. Like, you know, and I think that's a great question because you've got more people. They're built in as short term yeah. or maybe you could speak to how long the people Absolutely. stay in your, your units or your host units. But um, kind of what what's the eviction rate and average cleanup costs between yeah. we call it tenant turnover. Right. So the turnover costs. Um, and then he's asking about like I, I service and stuff like that. I'll try and churn through them. So the uh, the eviction rate is is very low. You're talking about you know one and a half percent. It it does happen. It happens more often when we're in an eviction moratorium and people think that um, you know they can maybe get away with it for longer. Mm -hmm. um, evictions a painful part of this and any sort of real estate business, obviously, um, and it's expensive and everything else. And we partner with a you know a third party vendor that's national who can kind okay. of do a lot of that work and file for you. Um, it is a straightforward process. It's exactly the same as any other eviction. Um, but yes, it's, you know, when I'm working with uh, a prospective host on a pro forma, I, I work with them to sort of bake it into the, your sort of occupancy underwriting. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a very conservative underwriter because I'm a very kind of the conservative investing kind of guy. Um, so you know, for example, I always tell people to underwrite to 85% occupancy, even though we've essentially always been above that because, hey, look, you might have an eviction. Now, that's also part of the strength of the, the model in that you have that six-bedroom home and someone's getting evicted. Look, that's a pain, but the property's still cash flowing. Right. And even if it takes, you know, four months in Georgia, which would be really slow, uh, the property's cash flowing the whole time. So it doesn't make it any easier. It doesn't mean it's it's fun or that you, you know, pat yourself on the back. It's just that um, 
you know, you're able to keep cash flowing, cover your debt service, cover the utilities, kind of the whole bit, and you're not kind of eating it, uh, which mm-hmm. is very important. And of course, we're in the markets when for a reason. Um, so the right. second question around the maid service and the, the bathrooms and so on, we're agnostic. Now, what I recommend is getting a once a month cleaning service for the common areas. Very simple, you know, kind of like 30 minutes in and out, you know, wiping down toilets, wiping down countertops, essentially doing the things that are, um, you know, kind of common area messes that would be hard or, or whatever for any one person to do, or that I don't trust people to do. So like right. I went to the Eagle Academy, I've mopped a floor in my life. I don't trust most people to mop. You know, I, I like the cleaning lady doing it. I think they're better at it, that kind of thing. Uh-huh. Um, so I think well, and I would imagine, and correct me if I'm wrong, but now you've got like four to six strangers. They don't know each other. Maybe they begin to know each other. I don't know. But like, who's it going to be? Like, usually there's one person more neat, freaky than the other person. And so you tend to have people that don't care and leave it. I mean, I would think there would be disagreements around this kind of stuff. How do you, do you guys get a lot of calls about like people? Oh, he didn't, he ate all my food out of the fridge and you know, this one never cleans good enough. And so I guess having a a cleaning service like you would with Airbnb, every time there's a guest move out and a guest move in, you've got the cleaning people in between. Right. So this is just an ongoing thing, but how do you mitigate, um, sure. is it in the rules that people need to grow up. <laughs> you know, how, how do you... <laughs> it's in the rules. Can you actually make rules like that? Yeah. <laughs> you kind of, how do you handle that kind yeah, of no, it's, it's a great question. Game. Game. <laughs> it's part of the service that we provide and that we have a 24 seven call center that gets those, you know, you know, uh, key fate, my peanut butter, you know, okay. That comes to As us. He would. Right. I know, you know, um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, ultimately we have certain endpoints that are, that's what our customer support team is trained to do is kind of de-escalate these situations. So maybe, Hey, do you just want to vent? Okay, fine. Do you want to give them a rating? You know, they all rate each other and all that sort of stuff. Great. Oh, I forgot. You said there was a rating system for each other, for, each other, for the properties, for maintenance tickets. kind Which of again, thing. the brilliance of Airbnb and VRBO, right? The host r- rates the tenant or the guest, and then the guest also gets to, so now it's between them. Exactly. So and this is on the uh, platform. Like, does everyone have their rating, their profile, so to speak? Yep, yeah, exactly. Oh, so, okay. So sometimes people just want to give someone a nasty rating, you know, and that's fine. Okay, cool. Right, it happens. Um, yeah. And sometimes people want to transfer, Right. That's also a very important endpoint and part of why we like to have critical mass in any of our markets. Mm-hmm. That, you know, living with roommates is hard. Um, living with anybody's hard. You know, I, I said for my wife's out of the house, but uh, so I could say it. Yeah, uh, my husband's on the call right now. Tom, don't okay, even okay, say well, yeah. anything in that chat box. <laughs> right. um, but, it, you know, living with living with people can be hard. Um, and sometimes people need to move or Hey, I, you know, you think about the demographic we serve, you know, if you're making 15 bucks an hour on one side of town and someone offers you 18 bucks an hour on the other side of town, you're taking the job and maybe you just want to transfer for work to be a little bit closer, you know, and that, mm-hmm. that flexibility is a big part of the value proposition and that release valve and the transfers are. Uh, so that's, that's super important in terms of what we do. Um, mm-hmm. And so, yeah, I mean, is it. And probably like section eight or any, not that this is subsidized, but you want a good rating because you want to keep uh, renting from pad split or, you know, they want to, yeah. and probably in the back of their minds, like, man, these guys are in other cities. If I have to move, they already know me. I can move and, you know, have a place to land. Like I, I'm imagining that for well, a certain I'm, part of your clientele, this is in the back of their minds. Absolutely. They want to be good. They want to have a good rating on their, your system. Good. And I mean, look, people fall behind sometimes and, you know, there's decisions to be made. You can imagine as, as a host, if someone moves in and they're the house jerk and they fall behind, not a lot of leeway, but if they're right. the house sweetheart and everyone loves them and they're helpful and they're, they're doing all these things and they've been with you for a year and they fall behind, it's like, Hey, I like, let's think about how we can work through this or have a payment plan. So those things are really important. Um, absolutely. That's a great point. How do you, how do you guys handle when someone gets behind because we're the host, Yep. you're, you're the, you're our platform, you're our help, you're the first line of defense, right? So what action do you take 
So we uh, managed someone's behind and then when do we come into play? Yep. So we managed the whole collections process um, because you can imagine if you have six people in a house and they're paying weekly and maybe partial payments and all those things, you might have 30 payments a month. Um, and so we, we handle all the collections and the late fees and call text email harass pieces and you know all that piece. Um, and then remit the one payment to your bank account so your lender's happy and all that, your bookkeeper is happy, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, now, the fact is we basically have a cutoff, which the host can influence and kind of set one way or the other, but we have kind of a, a, a cutoff for folks that's based off our kind of best practices and so on, that if they fall behind and they don't kind of make it up within sort of the set time period, we recommend the termination of that occupancy to the host, right? And you can say yes or no, or you can set it on auto, auto approve. Um, and then essentially what happens is we have an easy way, hard way conversation with the resident to say, listen, you know, Frank, you know, you fell behind. This is what happened. You know, here, here you are, you know, this door one, shake hands, no big deal. We're not going to send it to collections. No one's going to file mark on your record, whatever no mark on your record. If you want to come back, you'll have to pay off this debt first. That's fine. But, you know, you can come back in six months. It's no big deal. You're not banned. You can come back in a year. Uh, we have some support services that we work with. You know, we can kind of help you out. You want Where they can go because now they're homeless, right? Exactly. Okay. Um, you know, you want, you need a referral, like no big deal. You need an extra 24 hours to get a ride. Like, let's, let's talk about that. All good. Um, but you can't stay here. You know, that's door one. Door two, a file for eviction. In the states that we're in, it's just a matter of when. It's not a matter of if, you know, and it's, we have all the documentation and all this sort of stuff. And we're going to send this debt to a collections agency. You're going to be put out. Every time you apply to an apartment, this thing's going to pop up. Yeah. Every time you're going to get a job, our hand's going to be out for the judgment. Your choice. Um, you know, just let us know what you want to do. And most people are really quite pragmatic, you know? Right, and, uh, right, sure. Right. And so um, that's really how we keep the eviction rate low because people do fall short. You know, we are in a subprime part of the market. That's the kind of person who needs co-living and needs this offering. To pay by week, who needs co-living, yeah. So we, um, but we obviously, you know, our view and, you know, my personal view is that eviction is bad for everybody. Um, yeah. It's expensive for the landlord. It's expensive for the guests. They sometimes people think like, "Hey, this this is smart." It's not smart, you know. It, it lives with you a long time, mm -hmm. um, and so you know, most people really, uh, you know, our view is most people don't want to go down that path. And if we can come to something that's uh, less than that, we can get there. Some people want the hard way, you know. That's that's life. Um, you know, that's there's no way that you can force their hand per se. It's like, you got to right. go through the process. That's fine. Um, we just want to make it not attractive because we don't think it's, it's mm -hmm. kind of everybody. So uh, that brings me to a, a good question and we're kind of running out of time. Well, we ran out of time already. So I'll hurry, but what, what are the, um, the screening pro or not screening? What are your, um, uh, you know, qualifying, qualifying uh, underwriting mm -hmm. characteristics, like so many times the income, such and such credit, or credit mm -hmm. score, which I doubt, but you know, what are your criteria for saying yes to a tenant? Great question. So we do, we are checking on four things um, to approve them before we send the booking request to the host. Now, some hosts actually will just auto approve. So it's uh, not a concern, but let's assume you're, you want to be in the flow in this scenario. So we are doing a background check. We are doing a credit check. It's not uh, It's not so much a matter of a min credit score because it's uh, not super helpful for what we do, but we're checking for, do they have, uh, you know, medical debt versus debt to a landlord? You know, how many accounts are in collections, those sorts of things to give a uh -huh. kind of credit rating relative to other people who we have. So background credit, we do an income verification and an employment verification. So again, okay. we're linking to their bank account or... If they don't have that, we're manually checking pay stub. We've kind of an overseas uh, service center. That so you that. ask people to send in their pay stub and then you verify that it's actual legitimate pay stub? Exactly. Okay. So, so and that, then you check with the employer? Yeah. So we're, so that's coming in. And then, 
you know, let's say that, uh, you know, I'm the applicant, I've passed those things. If I, you know, fail the background check, I'm, I fail it, you know, I'm out. Um, or if I don't have income, I, I fail, I, you know, I'm not allowed to apply. So I'm approved now. I can now request to book a room. So I request to book room one in your property. You get your request in your platform, you know, via email and whatever. Um, and it says, here is Frank. Here is, you know, he has zero evictions in the last seven years, you know, whatever. We, we show eviction data. Here's the kind of composite credit. Um, here's the income that he's verified for. And that's what he's approved up to, um, you know, our recommendation. Now, you can kind of set that where you want. But, um, you know, for example, if I'm making a hundred bucks a week, I, you know, you don't want me, you know, anywhere. I'm not going to. Yeah, how are you affording a hundred dollars a week if you make a hundred dollars? And, and realistically, essentially nowhere is at a hundred bucks a week in 2022. You know, our right. average price is more like 160 a week, but mm -hmm. yeah. It's, um, but okay. If I'm making 400 bucks a week, Hey, it's a different game, you know, whatever, right. a week, all those sorts of things. So what I'm approved to what I make, um, I may be missing one or two things on the the process. It's not a whole lot, you know, it's just and kind some of, people might be wondering this. Sorry. We, yeah. Um, why weekly? Why do you guys charge right. weekly as opposed to month? Cause you could just say your room is a thousand a month or 800 a month or whatever. Why is, why is that in, in, that you guys do that? We, we do it for two reasons, but first the, the main one is our view and then not everyone would agree with us, but I, I feel this way is that um, the reason that, landlords bill monthly isn't a particularly good one. You know, why do we do it? Our lenders like it. Our bookkeepers like it. It's easy operationally. It's like, I'm only thinking about collections the first week of the month, you know, whatever. Um, but it's not super intuitive for customers, particularly low-income customers. Um, mm -hmm. And so like when we'd, we'd have evictions and kind of traditional rentals and you'd, you'd peel back the onion, you say, Man, you know, hey, how did, you know, how do we get to this place? And you say, okay, well, I paid my credit card bill or, you know, I paid my uh, cell phone bill. It's like, okay, fine. I, I pay my furniture bill. And you're like, okay, well, that seems, you know, rent a center, if you're familiar, they're smarter than landlords. They bill at the end of the month because they know most people pay their bills sequentially. <laughs> and, you know, people That's will funny. Feel, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. So they're, you know, they're it clever. Makes sense, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, because they want to get paid. Now you can look at it and say, well, hey, that was a terrible idea. Your couch is going to be on the street. Um, but that's the way that people are. So our view is that if we bill weekly, especially for people who are lower financial literacy, you know, less capacity to kind of build savings. Well, it's a budgeting thing. A lot of people in that economic strata of 15 to $17 an hour, they're paid weekly, right? right. They're not salaried. They're well, and just in terms of your, your rhythm, not exempt, so, yeah. you know, when's the first of the month? Yeah. I have no idea. It's in a couple of weeks, but when's Friday? Well, today's Saturday it was yesterday. I get my bill on Friday. Like I get paid on Friday and we actually built the technology to let people set their due date whenever they want. Mm. If you get paid on Wednesdays and it's, it's like the old, like kind of a, like a Charles Dickens thing of like, Oh man, I need to like, get that money away from the guy before he spends it at the bar sort of thing. It's like, yep. Hey, if you could pay it on a Wednesday, so you want the auto pay to hit on Wednesday, that's fine. That's mm -hmm. fine. So they can set it whenever they yeah, want. Yeah, My husband can tell you lots of stories about how guys budgeted. <laughs> exactly. You know, paycheck so, uh, Thursday, no work Friday. Right. I was a younger man once. So I get it, but um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so, the, uh, okay, um, the idea is to really have a much stronger customer focus than kind of the traditional model. Is yeah, that makes sense. Matching it up to their abilities, yeah. right? Their capability, money wise, but their ability to manage their money, I guess, yeah. right? So, exactly. very cool. So, since we're already over time, I'm just really loving this conversation um, and, and learning more. And, and it sounds like you're fine tuning and tweaking not only your system, but how you present what you do. I think in 2019, it was a little fuzzier maybe, or maybe yeah. I'm 
understanding it better, um, but likening it to the Airbnb and, you know, doing comparisons like that is super helpful. Um, so going on to uh, kind of like the opportunity for accredited investors. Um, so accredited investors, in case you guys don't know, I'm just hitting the pause button. I think most of you on the call right now know what it is, but if you don't and you're listening to this recording, feel free to reach out to us, but just briefly, if you're single making salary or income of 200,000, if you're married and you make 300,000, or if you have assets of a million dollars outside of your house's equity, in other words, you cannot count your house, but any other investments, if that all adds up, equity, security, securities, bonds, whatever, all your investments add up to a million dollars or more. You are an accredited investor or an eligible qualified investor, but check with your CPA, your attorney, anyone that you get a, get advice from to find out if you really are accredited. That being said, what's the accredited investor opportunity? I think you mentioned that, right? Yeah, no, thanks for all those caveats. You spared me from having to do it. Um, <laughs> I say it often enough now. I'm just like, oh, little, little, little. Exactly. Um, so we have, it's kind of the uh, continuation on of that fund, that sidecar fund that we talked about. Um, and we have set up, so we, we had our kind of fund one that was really a prototype fund. Um, and we're now open with fund two, which is open to accredited investors. Um, who, so you used your family office guy in New York as a guinea pig, and now you're, you're opening <laughs> well, up. He actually, we... Um, we wanted him to invest in the fund and he decided for, which is fine. He's like, Hey, I, I'm never an LP. I own assets. So we essentially set up a, a fund in a box for him. Okay. Uh, for, <laughs> you know, we set up a lot of the infrastructure, but he owns everything, takes all the risk, you know, and, and so on, um, writes mm -hmm. all the checks, but keeps all the upside, you know? Um, okay. So he didn't, he didn't invest in our fund. Our first fund um, was, essentially friends and family, friends and family, right. Kind of, okay. uh, you know, ourselves and that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. not some big grand thing. My friends and family aren't that fancy. Um, but you know, we, we put it together. It was really to prove out the model, build out those first couple, but then we'd really hired the team and had built some expertise. We thought, okay, well, Hey, we'll keep, let's keep an open-ended fund. So it's open to accredited investors. Um, you know, happy to send kind of the, the documents and, you know, PPM or, you know, people want to look through it. That's all, all well and good. Um, but we're buying in five cities. So Jacksonville, Tampa, Atlanta, Houston, DFW. Good. So okay. this money is being used to buy actual properties under pad splits name, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're technically third key homes, but they're all pad split, uh, you know, all pad split properties. And yeah, so essentially that's kind of the crux of it. So it is, it is truly, it is to be an LP in the fund. You know, it's not, uh, there's no operational component to it. It's just like any other, kind of typical real estate GPLP type fund. Um, and that's, that's kind of what we're doing. It's so, okay. it's, uh, and so what, what's the minimum investment and the, uh, you know, the return and how long does someone need to stay in the fund? That kind of thing. Yep. So uh, it's hundred K minimum. It's a five-year hold, 8% uh, pref with 20% promote. And we project a 20% return. Mm -hmm. Okay. And are you limiting it to in the prospectus? Does it say those particular cities? Or are you um, we, uh, we get open to other cities? We we kept it open. Okay. Uh, now, realistically, uh, I think it's unlikely. I mean, we might do Orlando just because Tampa and Orlando are practically one city anyway. Um, mm -hmm. So we didn't we didn't limit it to those cities, but it's you know there's enough uh, volume in those five that there isn't really a strong forcing function for us to leave those mm -hmm. cities. You know, like, could you imagine a scenario where maybe someone else, one of our customers opens up San Antonio and we think, Oh, you know, th this feels really validated. Let's push in there. I yeah. So if you had, so if I heard you right, if you had one of your host clients or maybe one of your investors in your fund mm -hmm. say, Hey, I'm already here. I want to go there. You could actually help them vet it out if it makes sense and, and exactly. go with that. Right. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, the them one, wanting to invest and you being the platform. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, the one thing that's changed really since 2019 in terms of how we think about opening new markets is um, we're much more interested in more of a pull than a push model today. So when we last spoke, we thought, hey, we want to go to Houston. How do we get into Houston? We went there and kind of waved our arms on a street corner and no one paid attention to us. So then we bought our own houses and went. And now we've gotten to the point, and some of that's that we've launched a few, 
that, uh, for example, we just launched Las Vegas, but we didn't, we aren't buying in Las Vegas or anything else. An investor came to us and said, Hey, I'm, I own 400 properties. I really believe in this. I think it'll work here. We thought, okay. So he you know, begged us to come and we said, yes, sir. And so, so how many has he onboarded so far in Vegas? He's just on board his first three properties. So he is okay. this is three weeks old, essentially. Um, okay. But going in with an anchor investor who has a ton of conviction and knows the market and can really kind of validate a lot of those assumptions early mm-hmm. on. You know, one of the things we realized that we should have always known, I think, is that, you know, real estate is so hyper local that it really helps having local <laughs> operators. Um, we've oh, always yeah. You need boots on the ground that know every nook and cranny of the place to... Exactly. To go fast and to and to leverage it the most, right? Exactly. I mean, everyone everyone kind of hates outsiders, you know, and uh, it's one of those things where you know, for this gentleman Carl, you know, he's it's like, oh, you know, if I have to call this person, if I have to call permitting, well, I will call Pete because I've known him and I've done a hundred projects and this and that, and he'll pick up the phone. And there, it's impossible to just sort of do that. You would have to do a lot of handshaking and lot a lot of REIA meetings to get to where he can. Exactly. Zoom into right. So yeah, focused. Yeah. So we've we're really pretty uh, keyed in on the markets where we're in. We've built some supply and you know kind of proven some things out and built some of those relationships. And I'm less eager to jump into new ones, to be honest. Now we will follow hosts into new markets, undoubtedly. Uh, you know, I suspect we'll probably launch another half dozen markets over the next two years, but mm-hmm. we will be pulled in. Right. Right. That makes a whole lot of sense. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So let me just check to see if there's any other questions. I think we got another one that came in. Um, Yeah, what kind of peanut butter? Um, For solo 401k or SDIRA customers, country fund can affect whether this fund works for them or they get hit with various taxes. Great question, Keith. That is uh, perhaps above my pay grade and maybe a better question for um, either our attorney or, you know, your tax professionals or so on. Um, that, yeah, yeah, because I, I wonder if you're investing in a fund that's buying property. I'm assuming you're taking on debt. Or are you buying these free and clear? So we are buying them free and clear and then putting long term debt on the properties. To yeah. Sort of so there might be a them. UBIT kind of situation. So, yeah, I would check with your yeah. with your your whoever's doing your self-directed IRA stuff and yeah. CPA, obviously. Yeah, I uh, it's it's a good question. I do believe we have some self-directed IRA customers, um, but I don't. Yeah, do not uh, do not. The tax advice you get from me is worth what you pay for it. So. <laughs> okay. okay, great. Well, if there's no other questions, oh, let me see. Number eight. EBIT needs to be managed. Okay. Um, yeah. So you just yeah. I don't know. We do uh, we do pass through depreciation. Um, I don't know if that really answers your question. It, you yeah, know, he'll need to consult someone yeah. for all that. Okay, great. Well, I think that's it for today. Thanks for hanging out a little longer than we thought. Yeah. This is this is amazing. Congrats on the growth. That's 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 amazing. And I'm so excited that you're in Indianapolis. And actually, you know, we thought of investing in Richmond, uh, Virginia. I'm assuming you mm. meant. Um, yep. And then I do have some boots on the ground in Vegas, so I'll let them know because. You never know who might want to look into this, right? Because Vegas is a tricky market, you, especially when values are up over there. The rents don't go up that fast to match the price. So this might actually be. And they have so many service workers that that this would fit so well. So definitely the, the business model makes a lot of sense. And um, yeah, I'm excited. to. I think Keith actually has a property I'm thinking of that might fit this. So um, it might be a good guinea pig to... Right. He's in a one of his properties is in a student housing area. And when you said, oh, yeah, the neighbors don't care because they're in student housing. Well, this neighborhood is near a university and it's right. definitely student housing. And um, so it might work for him uh, for that well, property. Yeah, Vegas so, is super hot for us. So we're at a, we're at 100 percent occupancy in Las Vegas. Oh, in Vegas. Yeah. His is in Indianapolis. But oh, okay. uh, yeah. Yeah. And he's also been great. Yeah. But Vegas, too, you know, they they're they're growing so much and now they have a sports team and it's you know they've got they've got a lot going on there so hopefully hopefully we don't see a dip out there like we did in the past but they tend to be the first to dip so we'll see 
We'll see. Um, so thank you very much, Frank, for updating us on pad split, letting us know the new opportunity and just your growth. And, and, and it sounds like we're, we're, uh, we're really able to jump on board because Atlanta, I don't know anything about, Atlanta, but I, but I really could see your business model working for so many of us in other cities. So, and hopefully in California soon, right? Yep. Hopefully, hopefully. We'll get there someday, you know. Yeah, down. right, right. Okay, well, thank you for joining us, uh, Frank. And we will put at the end of this video, there'll be your contact information. Yep. Um, but if you want to let people know now, how, what's the best way to contact you? You have a super easy email, I guess. Yeah. I would Frank at padsplit.com uh, is, is kind of the easy way. Or, you know, you can, of course, just go to our site and create an account. Mm -hmm. And uh, our account executives will be hounding you. So either way, we'll work <laughs> just fine. Okay, so Frank at padsplit.com. If you have yeah. any other questions or if you want to run a property by him, he'll direct you to the right people. Or if you're interested in the uh, accredited investor opportunity, you can also contact him. Shall. So thank you. Have a great weekend. And we won't let three years go by next time. We'll get you on quicker than that so we can get okay. the updates. Awesome. Okay. Thank thanks, Frank. And thanks everyone right. for joining us. Bye now. Thank you for watching our video. I hope you liked the content. And if you did, be sure to like and subscribe our channel. See you soon.